chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Here we go. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen, had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment, their torment was like the torment, like the torment of a scorpion, when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplate breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Two woes. First one's past. Recognize this. No longer, just to get reoriented, no longer are the seals being broken. They're all broken. This is the fifth angel, and this is number five out of seven angels that stand before God. So he sounds it, and we see that a star that had fallen to the earth. So there's a star. The question is, is this a literal star? And I don't mean in terms of literally like our sun, that type of star. It could be a star or a meteor or a comet or something like that. Is it a literal star or is it a figurative star? Well, Job, Isaiah, Daniel, and Revelation all use the word star to denote an angel. Like an angel of, of God or a fallen <coughs> angel, one or the other. Uh, so we see that there it's used, and frequently in Revelation it's used that way, but it's also used literally to describe uh, the astronomical, uh, astronomical phenomenon of something from outer space uh, that hits the earth, that sort of thing, a comet or a meteor or otherwise. So we see that this uh, is an angel because this angel is, is given keys to the abyss. Uh, a meteor is likely not given keys to the abyss. Uh, a comet is likely not given keys to the abyss. So this is an angel, and it specifically says that it's an angel that had fallen. Past tense, completed action. It had fallen to the earth. So this fallen angel was given a key to the abyss. Keys to the abyss. Uh, but what is this abyss? Well, that's not what it says here. It says bottomless pit, right? It should really say shaft of the abyss. It is a much better translation for them to write shaft of the abyss. The abyss is talking about something specific. I mean, what does pit mean to us? Not much. It could be all sorts. You know, uh, Joseph was thrown into a pit, right, of sorts. Right. So, yeah, a hole in the ground. Uh, but this is the abyss. This has a, a real meaning to it especially in the culture that he's writing this to, which is very much a Greek-oriented culture. Yes, they're Romans, but everybody in Rome, the lingua franca, the common tongue, was Greek. And so here we see a, a reference to this ab abyss, which we've got to understand what it is, because we're, we see it actually in other parts of the Bible. Uh, Genesis 6. Genesis 6 
This might be difficult for some of you, others, it's not anything new that you haven't already heard. But in Genesis 6, we see that the sons of God looked upon the daughters of men and saw that they were very attractive and had wives with them and had children with them. Now, some say that the sons of God there is talking about the righteous line of Seth. But the historians, the earliest uh, church fathers, as well as Josephus and Philo and others who have uh, the keepers of Jewish history all say the same thing. It's fallen angels. And in fact, Jude and Peter both allude to this fact saying that these fallen angels at that time were cast into e eternal bonds under darkness. And Peter uses the word Tartarus. Well, Tartarus to the Greeks is the place where the most wicked titans went. The titans, the great war between the gods and the titans. And so the wicked titans were cast into Tartarus and they were uh, uh, following with them were some of the cyclopses and the giants and all those sorts of things. The great tales of the heroes of old and, and those amazing stories. Well, that's the the words that it used in Genesis 6, saying that these were giants, uh, men of old, men of renown. These are uh, stories that people know. Okay, I'm not saying that there were gods and titans really doing battle with one another. The Greeks are partially right, though. Because the real story, and, and understand this, in, in history, there, everybody has their opinion. Ancient history, modern history, whatever. There is a real history. One that is not changed. Okay? In my contention, and in all my studying, it is, the Bible has the real story. There are so many flood stories. Okay? And some of them very close to what the Bible says. Some of them quite different. Okay? But there are flood stories from all over the world. These guys were right about something. Because, uh, as Jude and Peter both say, the angels from that time were cast into Tartarus. These wicked angels were thrown there and where they're held in eternal bonds of darkness. And that is this abyss that we see here. This, as Hades is the holding place for uh, unbelievers when they die until the final judgment when they are cast into the lake of fire. So Tartarus is the holding, or the abyss as it's also called, is the holding place for uh, wicked angels that are, are trapped now. I mean, trapped right now. There are some, and, and uh, these guys point to Genesis 6 as saying, those are the ones. Hey, remember in Luke 8, uh, where Jesus is talking to that guy that, the, that's possessed by the legion, and the legion says, oh, don't cast us into the abyss. That's right. So the, and, and Jesus didn't correct them. So for, from some perspective, they were concerned that they might get thrown here. They didn't want to go that, to that place. They probably knew people that were there. Highly, well, other fallen angels. They probably knew full well this story. Okay, so it's a place they don't want to go. Um, so we see. Just to clarify. Yeah, please. So there are angels who are faithful to God. Yes. There are yeah, angels yeah, that yeah. are fallen, but then there's this particularly naughty group of fallen angels. It's not all the fallen angels. Naughty. Yeah, they are naughty. At Christmas time. Yeah, exactly. There, there are fallen angels that are still free and about, yes. but there's this particular subset of the fallen angels that have been locked away in the abyss, according to Jude and Second Peter. Yeah. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, if you reflect on that, these angels were so wicked. They were the ones that... Uh, plunged mankind into such wickedness that every thought of their mind was, and heart was on wicked uh, all the time. And this culminated with the flood. The judgment of the flood. So, anyway. Alright. Out of the abyss, out of the, uh, the shaft of the abyss, comes great smoke. Uh, smoke, it darkens the sun again. <laughs> uh, and, and the air is darkened. It's darkened. Man, this continually darkening is going to have an emotional impact on people. All right? Unless you live in Alaska or something and you're used to it. Uh, <laughs> but it is going to have a serious impact. Now, are these locusts literal or are they figurative? 
But let me submit this to you. I'm fine either way, but I do want to say this. The word like and as is used so many times to describe these things. The one place it's not used is to say that John saying uh, something like locusts came out of the smoke. He says locusts came out of the smoke. He doesn't say like locusts. So he says locusts came out. So the word like is absent from describing something that he uses the word like to describe their appearance with. So like these are probably uh, some type of locust. They're given commands. These locusts are given commands. No, don't eat the grass. Don't eat the trees. Don't eat anything green at all. They had to be given that command. I don't think demons need to be given that command not to eat the grass and the trees and that sort of thing. I don't know, though. I mean... Well, that's, I mean, yeah, don't harm. You're right. You're right. Uh, but typically what a locust would do would be eat it. Oh, I see. So, right. Thank you. The word eat is not in there. You are right. And I'm not trying to put it in there by saying that. Does a locust look different than a grasshopper? Uh, no, not to my eyes. <laughs> yeah, good question. So there's, there's command given to them to do something that, or to not do the very thing that locusts naturally want to do. Uh, demons, remember the previous slide, uh, in Jude says that they're in eternal bonds and darkness. And their final judgment comes when they are also thrown into the lake of fire, which was prepare, prepared for the devil and his angels, right? So if they're stuck in there awaiting this judgment, then why are they being set free? Of course, it could be that other demons who are not so naughty, right, are in there, and they're allowed to be released, and the reason that they're in there and they're going to be released is to do the thing that these things are going to do. Look, I don't care either way. Uh, for, from where I'm at right now, it seems pretty evident that it's some type of physical bug, locust. That is, th th these are some scary uh, locusts, actually. This one's not a locust, but this is a scorpion fly. It's a real thing. We don't have any here. And this is a Wita, a locust, huge locust with this long stinger thing at the end. Um, anyway, uh, see that these things are commanded to harm those who don't have the seal of God on their heads. So the 144,000 are protected, and I would submit to you any converts at that time will also be protected. They're not allowed to kill, and there'll be no death from these stings, though they will want to die. And this is going to go on for five months, which is 150 days on our lunar calendar, which we will deal with at some other point. But for five months, they are allowed to torment the earth. This is a long time. Okay? The people that get stung by this are going to long to die, but death will flee from them. They will not be able to die. And let's see, uh, let's see why. I looked up, it says like, the torment that they will experience is torment like what people experience when they are stung by a scorpion. So I looked up to see what are the symptoms that follow being stung by some of the more nasty scorpions on this planet. Searing pain that can last for days and the constant firing of pain receptors in the area so that if you touch the area at all, it just sets it off all over again. Increased heart rate, nausea and vomiting chest tightness, abdominal cramping, convulsions, breathing troubles, fluid in the lungs, frothing at the mouth, unconsciousness, general weakness, and paralysis. Not pleasant whatsoever. Painful. The picture I want you to see here, they will long to die, but they will not be able to. It's going to be so bad for them when they are stung by this, that they're just going to have to passively lay there. Even if, if they had a gun in arm's length, they couldn't get to it, okay? Because it's that bad, the pain. And this picture here, this guy is in a locust swarm. Going to be really hard to avoid getting stung. The pain is going to be so unbelievable. Maybe about the time that you're feeling better, you get stung again. So I don't, I don't, it's going to be, it's bad. This is so much, worse. if you just look at it without this type of thing, understanding, this is really going to happen, okay? This is a bad judgment. And for five months, if you said a day, or for three days, these things will be here, 
Well, that gives you hope. But if you're one month into it saying, when is this going to end? you got four more months. So this is a serious thing. Now, I want you to notice the description here, and I tried to emphasize it, about their appearance. The appearance of these locusts is heavily figurative. Okay, they are, Their appearance was like horses prepared for battle. It doesn't say that they have horse legs, as some of the artists have drawn. I don't know how well you can see this. It doesn't say that they have horse legs. It says that they're prepared, they're arrayed like a horse, a Roman horse, that's uh, prepared for battle, which a Roman horse is going to have some armor on it. Okay, armor appropriate to the time of the Romans, not, not armor that you'd look up and see the Knights of the Middle Ages where it's like... A locust themselves, if you look at them, they're heavily armored. That exoskeleton looks like plate mail. Uh, breastplates and plates everywhere. They're, I mean, they're heavily armored. But all of the things that describe them, just realize it's a figurative description. Okay, Like a man's face. Like women's hair. Like a scorpion. Okay, These are similes. Okay, And not uh, necessarily literal. Although there are some pretty uh, cool, if you go out there and look, there's some, there's some pretty cool pictures of what they look like. Uh, but the one thing that is missing is that John says locusts came out of the smoke. And maybe it was so thick with locusts that the, it's not even smoke. Maybe it's the locusts are so thick that uh, there's, which I've got a picture here, I think, um, on a, another slide. They really got out early. We have 10 minutes. I mean, seven minutes. Feels like 10. All right. Uh, Abaddon and Apollyon. This is an interesting thing. Notice that uh, this is the angel of the abyss. It sounds to me like it's the fallen angel that got the key. Now, I also want to submit to you, it could be that that angel, the star that had fallen to the earth, could be an angel of God that wasn't an, a naughty angel, but an angel that uh, is, uh, who, who is of God and not of the devil. But that angel could have been given the keys to the abyss to do this sort of thing. But I think it's the fallen angel. I think it's Apollyon, or about well, I would think the jailer would be God's angel. Yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, that's a possibility, absolutely. Uh, but the the language used there leads me to think it might be, and I want to say the word "might" without saying it can't be one of God's angels. No, no, because you're right. The jailer makes sense, but every demon has to do whatever God tells them to do. So, which is a, another thing. So it's it's either or. But the interesting thing here is that the Hebrew name is given first. And then the Greek name is given. Why is, is this guy, John, writing to a bunch of Greeks, giving them a Hebrew name? He's given them a Hebrew name because there's no Greek equivalent. Now there's Apollo. That sounds like Apollyon. Like Apollyon. But it is not. There is no Greek god named Apollyon. That's why he gives them the Hebrew name first. We do see the word Abaddon in Scripture. We see it in, in many places. Typically, you'll see Sheol and Abaddon together. And sometimes Sheol is just a generic term for death when you die. And sometimes Sheol is referring to a place that sounds an awful lot like Hades. In fact, in the Greek Old Testament, they use the word Hades for Sheol. And Abaddon... Uh, has the Greek word for destruction, when you see it in the Old Testament, when the, the Greek Old Testament, they use the, this word, which is similar to Apollyon, but it's not quite, it's the same word for destruction. See, destruction and destroyer. Apollyon is like a, a proper name that you would give to this angel here. Destroyer. Okay, he's a destroyer. So, uh, Abaddon seems to, in, the, uh, in Greek, in the, in the mind of the Greek, this Abaddon, is in, which is the Hebrew, is the Abaddon. Tartarus would be the, what it corresponds to in the Greek. Sheol is the Hebrew. Hades is the Greek. Okay. Uh, and again, Russell, yeah, it's, this could be the same fallen angel that got the key, or it could be one of God's angels, one of God's elect angels uh, that got the key. I don't know, but this one might be the same angel that we saw at the beginning of the chapter, or not. I'm fine either way. Uh, now, some would say that he's in charge of the demons. The demons are these locusts. But 
also angels can have control over animals, and a locust would be an animal. Okay, that, there's nothing strange about that. Where do we see that? Demon controlling an animal. So, somebody give me Genesis. Ronnie, Ronnie, circle gets a square. Uh, yeah, Genesis, Satan and the serpent. You know, there you have it. Okay, um, this is the first woe. And th this is an actual picture of a swarm of locusts that plagued Madagascar. Looks like smoke. I saw Veronica's eyes get big. <laughs> She's like, whoa. Yeah, so it, it, it's going to be bad. You can't hide from this. And this will find its way into your house. Especially since they're not looking for grass or trees or anything green. They're looking for the inhabitants of the earth. Man flesh. It's orcs. orcs. Everything orcs. goes back to Tolkien. Alright, what are some what are some applications as we have four minutes left? Applications. How can you get any applications out of this? Alright, y'all have a wonderful no. <laughs> there are applications to be had. There are and these are just a few. Okay? I want you to learn to discern the difference between something that is literal and something that is figurative. When we're reading God's word, words have meanings. The word like really means something. Okay? It doesn't mean like and is are not the same word, right? Uh, so learn to see the difference and then to embrace the difference. Also be careful in what you read. I, I have uh, seminary professors, three of them that I listened to in preparation for this in particular. I wanted their takes on it and, and all of them made mistakes, which means I probably made some too. Um, but some of them, I had a couple of them said that it says in Revelation that they're like locusts. Well, it doesn't say like locusts. There's not even a variant that says like locusts. Unless there is. Where's Paul? Well, Paul's not here today. He probably would. Uh, make, carefully read scripture. Words have meaning. Take your time. Don't miss some things that, that are really important. Use those observations that you make to help you inform you what it really means and what it's really talking about. And also uh, understand that you don't know everything. I don't know everything, especially when we're talking about these sorts of things that pertain to the future. Leave space for your ability to make an error. Okay? And for somebody else to be right. That is why, Bruce, that is why I'm a pre-trib, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, but I'm not going to die on that hill. Okay? I'm fine if I'm wrong. I, I leave room for that. Visualize the events in Scripture. Bruce brought us the stench. Thank you for that stench. Uh, it's good. Because it... it helps you understand more of what it's really like. Like the, uh, the sting of the scorpion. You could see somebody laying there on the ground in horrible pain, uh, powerless to do anything about it. The pain is so severe they want to die. And they can't. Death flees from them. Uh, so visualize the events in Scripture. It really helps you to understand. It, ma it makes it more alive. Yes? Kurt. Should he also be sealed by God in salvation? You cheater. <laughs> 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 yes, Curtis. Excellent point. A circle gets a square again. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. You should. If you don't know the Lord... You should come to know the Lord. You should, you should come to salvation. Jesus died for your sins because you couldn't do it. Salvation belongs to our God and he who sits, he who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Uh, that was purchased for you by His blood because your blood can't do it. Um, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you find yourself coming into these times, which, my goodness... Uh, may or may not be in our lifetime, may or may not be in our grandkids' or great-grandkids' lifetime. I don't know when. I'm not a dater, not a date-setter. But come to know the Lord. Be sealed by the Lord. Be rescued from these things. God is the master of time and space.
He can pluck John up from the past and take him into our future and show him amazing things. He is the one that has formed the universe. It is in his hands. He is the one that could change it at a moment's notice. But he has established laws and he's established a path that we all must live in. That is the master. That is power. That is power that could crush you in a second because you're a worm. But that is not God. God is long-suffering and loving. He is not a sick tyrant that wants you dead. He wants you living. He wants you to know the truth. And that is what you should believe in. And not the deception that is to come. Um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you for this time and pray that you would bless everyone here. We thank you for Christmas time. We thank you that, Lord, you came to the earth in the flesh and you lived a perfect life and you died for us. Lord, I thank you that you've given us your word here. It's hard for us to understand this. There's a lot of symbolism and a lot of literalism and it's hard to sort between the two. Please be with everyone here, Lord. Help them to dig into the adventure that is your word and to reflect and marvel on how it is all true. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.